Okay, next question is from Brian who says, Paul, I've been hearing a lot about glyphosate recently. Joe Rogan posted about this. There was a study showing that many in the United States have glyphosate in their urine. Should I worry about glyphosate? Is there enough evidence for humans to really be concerned about this? So glyphosate is Roundup. Uh, I think there is certainly a lot of concern about glyphosate, but what does the evidence really show? So when you dig into this, what you find is that we probably need more research, but intuition, first principles, and common sense would say, get as little as you possibly can. And, and I'll talk a little bit about ways that we get exposed to glyphosate that we may not be aware of in a moment. But the summary article that I found on this was pretty balanced. A critical review of the effects of glyphosate exposure to the environment and humans through the food supply chain. So what they say basically as a conclusion in this article is that there are some studies that suggest that glyphosate is harmful in animal models. There certainly are associations which are observational between exposure to glyphosate in agricultural settings and some negative outcomes in humans. We know that glyphosate inhibits the shikimate pathway, which is involved in folate synthesis. Theoretically, it's not supposed to have activity in humans, except for the notion that that shikimate pathway is used by bacteria in our guts, and it certainly could have a role disrupting the gut microbiome, something that most of us would say is pretty important, critical, indispensable for optimal human health. If you look at this study, what you will find is that glyphosate has creeped into many of our exposures food, but also diapers, medical gauze, absorbents for female intimate hygiene, including tampons or pads. It's in our clothes. I went down a rabbit hole recently on glyphosate in my clothing, and now I'm wearing a wool shirt because I can't convince myself that glyphosate in cotton won't be absorbed into my skin. Now, I don't know for sure that this is a problem, so I'm trying to figure this out, but I have some concerns about that. I certainly... Uh, will take, I certainly intentionally, and with that in mind, I opted for organic cotton sheets on my bed, not wanting to sleep in cotton that wasn't organic, where I spend a lot of time in the bed while I'm sleeping. So I think if you limit your exposures to glyphosate, that's probably the most reasonable thing. For women, something I hadn't thought about as a man, how much glyphosate is in your tampons, how much glyphosate is in pads, is that a problem? How much glyphosate is in babies' diapers? Kids are getting exposed to this as children. We don't really know these questions. It definitely makes me curious and a little concerned. Kind of like PFAs, perfluoroalkylated substances, it's persistent and it's ubiquitous. So I'm at least taking precautions to limit my exposures to glyphosate as much as I can. That of course includes buying organic fruit when and where I can. I don't eat vegetables. And trying to find honey from regions of the world that are not near agriculture or places where there's not glyphosate sprayed, sprayed on crops nearby. I found another article showing that uh, over 60% of honeys were positive for glyphosate. I think the number is probably higher than that. But in this article, they give a number of interesting pieces of information. Um, Glyphosate is transformed into its main metabolite, AMPA, uh, maintains all the toxic characteristics of its precursor. It's even more persistent. The half-life of AMPA is 76 to 240 days. Basically, the takeaway there is that when it's in the environment, groundwater, it's there for a while. I couldn't find any great data on washing it out of clothes. I suspect that if you have a shirt or sheets and you wash them, I don't know how much glyphosate is going to be stuck in there. I can't imagine it's a ton, but I at least was cautious and avoided it with my bedding and my clothing. Many laboratory tests demonstrated the possible absorption of glyphosate in the gastrointestinal tract of humans and mammals, as well as absorption through inhalation, ingestion, and dermal contact. Hopefully few of you are exposed to glyphosate through dermal contact, but it's most of us getting exposed to it through our ingestions. The application of glyphosate in large quantities can also affect insects, bees, birds, uh, that's a bad thing. Colony collapse in bees is very scary for us. I do not think this should be something that we're using in the environment. I think pesticides in general should be very tightly regulated, very controlled. I wish there were a way for us to produce all the food we needed without using pesticides in general. It gets into deeper questions of how we farm and raise animals and plants. This is the 2016 research conducted at Boston, conducted at Boston University. Uh, and Abraxas LLC revealed that the herbicide is present in 62% of conventional honeys, 
45% of organic honeys. So if you look online, you can do a quick search for glyphosate-free honey on Amazon. I think there's only one that's certified uh, glyphosate-free. The best thing that I could say is that I have tried to get honey, at least in Costa Rica, from places that are not near farms. So it's a tricky thing. And uh, they're one of our sponsors for the podcast. The Yucatan honey from Ava Jane's, I believe, was certified to be glyphosate-free. Uh, the Yucatan Peninsula of um, Mexico being pretty good in that regard. So at least where they're harvesting that honey from. They say here that uh, two studies at the Munich Institute of the Environment um, found traces of glyphosate in 14 beers among the best known in Germany, Bex Polliner or Warsteiner and in panty liners from feminine hygiene company, Organic. So it's out there, guys. It is out there. Uh, their following products have glyphosate. So they list Kellogg's Corn Flakes and All Brand Plus Sticks. I don't know what All Brand Plus Sticks are, but they don't sound good. They had uh, 0.14 milligrams per kilogram. That's a significant amount of glyphosate. The, bus, the rest of these foods were wheat slices, flours, and spaghettis. Um, hopefully, very few of our of you are eating any of those things. The considering uh, the tolerable limit for pesticides in drinking water is 0.5 uh, micrograms per liter. And um, many samples in Italy at least had much higher levels of glyphosate in the water. Uh, some of you may want to get your water tested. You may want to use a filter. I use a reverse osmosis filter. I've talked about that in previous podcasts to get as much of the pesticide contamination out of my water as possible. Glyphosate has an interesting history of carcinogenic uh, classification, uh, originally classified as a category C substance, uh, showing limited evidence of car carcinogenicity, L originally classified, or in 1985, classified as a category C substance. In 1991, APA changed it to category E, uh, substances that do not show carcinogenic potential. Uh, but in March of 2015, the IARC, International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, France, a department of the WHO, labeled glyphosate as possibly carcinogenic to humans uh, to a category. Interestingly, that is a category that includes acrylamide, red meat, uh, bitumen, wood combustion fumes, et cetera. I've done previous podcasts on why I don't think red meat should be included in that analysis, but take from that what you will. So from this article, I looked for the most compelling research suggesting that glyphosate had problematic effects in animal or human models. And I came up with one study that I'll show you guys. This one is certainly a little bit concerning. Multi-omics, considering multiple metabolic and proteomic disturbances, reveal non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in rats following chronic exposure to an ultra low dose of the Roundup herbicide. So this is what's interesting for me is that they administered this to the rats for two years, which is a long time in rat years, at one at 0.1 parts per billion, which is 50 nanograms per liter. Remember that, well, two things to consider here. A rat is much smaller than a human, so we have to adjust this for human size versus rat size. But also remember that we were seeing um, 0.14 milligrams per kilogram, uh, which you can basically interconvert kilograms and liters in cornflakes and many of the pastas. So doses that are relatively equivalent when we're thinking about body size, administered for much of the lives of these rats. Most of us are probably exposed to glyphosate for most of our lives. These doses led to indications of fatty liver across multiple um, analyses in these rats. So they say here, overall metabolome and proteome disturbances showed a substantial overlap with biomarkers of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and its progression to steatohepatosis, thus confirm liver functional dysfunction resulting from chronic ultra-low glyphosate exposure. Not a good thing, so that's a little scary. We certainly know that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is an epidemic today, probably related to insulin resistance and metabolic dysfunction in general, but is it possible that low-dose glyphosate exposure in humans could contribute to steatohepatosis, accumulation of fat in the liver and non-alcoholic fatty liver in humans? I think it is. Um, it's at least something to be aware of and something to be concerned about. I don't think anyone should be completely convinced that glyphosate is benign for humans at this point in our lives.